symposium since its inception when I was still a grad student in Lawrence Lab. And so it's a great pleasure to be back and have the opportunity to share with you the work that I've been doing um, at Gilead. And as my title suggests, I'm going to talk to you about the work we've been doing using TLR7 agonist in the HIV cure space. Um, this may be a little bit redundant with the talk that you've heard this morning, but um, basically, um, in summary, we probably are all aware of the fact that current antiretroviral therapies, while pretty effective at suppressing viral replication, are ineffective at eliminating latent viral reservoirs. And even though patients may remain completely aviremic um, for decades, um, inevitably when they stop antiretroviral therapy, the virus rebounds. And so the elimination of this latent viral pool represents the primary challenge in the HIV cure space. There are a number of different approaches that are being explored in the field, and the one that I'm going to describe to you today is um, an immune-based strategy that you may have heard be referred to as kick and kill, but we like to call it activate and eliminate. And basically, the strategy involves um, an agent that could effectively reactivate viral reservoir from these latent pools, and um, either the same or a different agent simultaneously would eliminate these infected cells by engaging immune effector functions. The goal is to administer this type of therapy in the background of art to ensure that the reactivation doesn't actually expand viral reservoir. Um, and we anticipate that it will require a combination of two or more of such agents in order to achieve meaningful results. So this is the star of the show, our TLR7 agonist. Um, the chemical structure is shown on the top left. Um, and it's a molecule called GS9620. And I'll also refer to our um, precursor tool compound, GS436986. Um, so TLR7, as again you probably um, are familiar with, is a pattern recognition receptor. It's um, expressed uh, predominantly in plasmacytoid dendritic cells. And signaling through this receptor leads to the production of a variety of cytokines, interferon alpha being um, the primary, but also acute phase cytokines. And in doing so, um, TLR7 agonist accomplishes both the activation part of our strategy by turning on or activating CD4 T cells and also activating effector cells, um, thereby helping with elimination. So in, in, in vitro experiments, when we take um, PBMCs from art-suppressed by HIV-positive donors and treat them in culture with GS9620 um, and then look at supernatants to quantify viral production, you see um, Um, you see modest but significant induction of viral RNA in the supernatant. Of course, if you compare it to a potent mitogen, such as um, PMA and iron um, it's not as robust. But um, nonetheless, this is what we see. And we know that this activity is at least in part dependent on type 1 interferon production because when we use an interferon blocking antibody um, right here, we ablate this particular response. Um, I've also told you that um, TLR7 agonists can enhance um, immune activation and function, and shown here is flow cytometry data showing you the treatment um, of these PBMCs from art-suppressed um, HIV-positive donors results in upregulation of CD69 on the surface of both CD4 and CD8 cells, um, which signals their activation. Um, and similarly, it can also induce proliferation um, of T cells in culture as well as polyfunctionality, which we assess by looking at the production of interferon gamma and TNF alpha by CD8 T cells. And so that's all good and fine, but that's in vitro data and how do we translate that into um, an actual therapy. Um, the well-established model that's used in the field relies on the use of non-human primates, in our case, rhesus macaques of Indian origin. And when these animals are infected with simian homolog, SIV, or SHIV virus, which I'll mention in um, my last story, um, the virus replicates to high viral titers and leads to product, um, progressive loss of CD4 T cells and eventual progression to AIDS. Um, it should be noted that disease progression in these animals is more accelerated um, compared to human disease. And so one of the first studies that um, we did, which was done in collaboration with Dan Baruch and Harvard, was to combine this TLR7 agonist with a therapeutic vaccine. 
The vaccine used in this case is the same that's um, developed by Janssen. Um, it's a heterologous prime boost vaccine, um, which in which case prime is an adenovirus 26 vector, which encodes three viral proteins, GAC, pole, and envelope. Um, and the boost is a uh, vaccine modified viral vector, which encodes the same insert. And so in this particular study, we infect our animals with SIV MAC 251 uh, for just one week. And, um, and during this acute infection phase, we put them on antiretroviral therapy, which is a combination of these three drugs, um, and that effectively suppresses viral replication. Um, after 24 weeks of um, suppression, we initiate the therapeutic uh, vaccine administration to prime doses and two boosts and administer our TLR7 agonist, which is in this case the tool compound. Um, TLR7 agonist was given for a total of 10 doses every other week. Um, and at the end of this treatment phase, we release ART and look at what happens with viral rebound kinetics. And so that's the data I'm showing you here. You can see that in the placebo control um, group, all the animals rebound um, within about two weeks of ART stop. And in our TLR7 um, only treatment group, the rebound kinetics looked fairly similar. Um, no statistically significant differences. But we begin to see some differences in our vaccine and more notably in the combination treatment group, where in the combination treatment group we see 1.474 log reduction in set point, which is this viral load, load after the peak infection, and we also see a delay in rebound in some of the animals. And most notably, you can see that these three out of nine animals now display delayed control. And so that's suggestive to us that even though we may not have achieved sterilizing cure, um, at least functional cure is possible in this particular uh, model of acute infection um, and prolonged art therapy. And so that gives us a starting point to build on additional therapies to see if we could improve this particular phenotype. Um, an additional concept that we wanted to test was checkpoint inhibitor um, use. You may be familiar with checkpoint inhibitors in oncology. There are numerous already approved antibodies that block either PD-1 ligand or receptor. But similar to oncology, chronic viral disease like HIV also leads to upregulation of these exhaustion markers on the surface of virus-specific cells. Um, and a number of different groups have shown that this upregulation le leads to T-cell exhaustion, increased viral loads, and disease progression. And so the hypothesis is if we block um, this signaling, signaling axis, can we reinvigorate the cells and control disease? Um, and that, those experiments have been done with some uh, variable success, but those experiments have been done in chronically infected viremic non-human primates. And um, some groups have been able to show improved viral um, specific immune function, reduced viral loads, and improved survival. But if you think back to the model I've shown you earlier, our goal is to administer therapy in the background of ART because that's the patient population we're interested in treating. And so we wanted to test the hypothesis um, of whether um, blocking um, PD-1 receptor may be efficacious in our model. And so to do that, um, we again took Indian rhesus macaques, infected them with SIV MAC 251, um, and in this case allowed the infection to progress until early chronic phase um, before putting them on art therapy. You can see our art regimen effectively suppressed viremia, and we um, maintained these animals on art therapy for nearly two years um, until we initiated our treatment intervention. And so for treatment intervention, we split the animals into four groups of five, and again administered either our TLR7 agonists, in this case, GS9620, uh, a PD-1 blocking antibody, or the combination of the two. On bookends of the study, we took tissue biopsies so that we could look at the size or of the reservoir and see if we've uh, made a difference there. And of course, at the end of the study, we release ART and again look at viral rebound kinetics. And so the rebound data is shown here. You can see that in all four treatment groups, all five animals rebounded. And they rebounded within about two weeks of stopping ART, um, suggesting that there's really no um, efficacy in terms of, um, uh, of viral reservoirs or immune control. 
Um, we've also measured, um, as I mentioned to you, reservoirs in various tissues and again didn't see any statistically significant differences. Um, you may know that there's a couple of animals that look like they were maybe trying to control the infection, but these particular animals also started with low uh, baseline pre-art set points and so relative to their baselines the changes were not significant. And so, um, you know, the discrepancy between some of the prior studies and our study could probably be explained by the fact that our animals were really well suppressed. And so the level of immune exhaustion was probably minimal. And so while this therapy might have application in a more early chronic infection before art suppression, um, in this particular instance, it doesn't appear to be efficacious. And the last study that I'd like to describe to you um, combines the use of our TLR7 agonist and a broadly neutralizing antibody. So in the recent years, um, researchers have began to identify broadly, neutral antib broadly neutralizing antibodies from patients that have been infected for a long time. And these antibodies can effectively neutralize secreted viral particles, but they can also bind to a um, viral envelope that's expressed on the surface of infected cells and engage effector cells to eliminate these. And um, that's why Gilead became interested in potentially developing them into therapeutics. And in 2014, we actually licensed the family of these antibodies from Theraclone and are currently um, developing them for therapy. Um, the exciting part was that when we tested the um, this, well, one of these particular antibodies in vitro in combination with GS9620. So we basically took, in this case, uh, PBMCs from uninfected patients or uh, volunteers and treated them with TLR7 and took autologous CD4 T cells and infected them with HIV and then mixed the two together and measured uh, what is the cell killing of infected CD4 T cells. Um, shown in gray here is the dose response curve with the antibody called PGT121. And what you could see is that in the presence of TLR7, this curve shifts to the left, um, suggesting that we actually enhance killing by these antibodies in the presence of our TLR7 agonist. Um, the negative controls here are basically um, mutants that don't allow binding to the FC receptor. And so for our preclinical study, um, we recently tested the hypothesis of combining this therapeutic antibody with our TLR7 agonist. Again, we split the animals into four groups. Um, and similar to the first study, infected the animals for just one week before putting them on art um, therapy. Um, note that in this particular case, we had to infect them, infect them with the SHIV virus because the antibody cannot neutralize SIV envelope, but can neutralize HIV envelope. And so we have to use this chimeric virus. Um, one important distinction is that we also had to introduce this antibody washout period, and that's important because the antibody itself can act as a direct acting antiviral. And so if the vi virus rebounds when we stop ART, uh, we wouldn't know if we've necessarily cured the animals or it's just the effect as a DAA at this point. So we wanted to make sure that before we release ART, um, the antibody levels are below therapeutic levels um, so that we could really ask a question, did this antibody do something during the aviremic phase? Um, and this was the outcome. Um, you can see that the rebound is a little bit less uniform and that's just the nature of infection with the SHIV virus relative to SIV. Uh, but in summary, um, our sham treated animals, 11 out of 11 eventually rebounded with this peak viremia and settled at these set points. Um, TLR7 only treated group um, wasn't statistically different from the sham, but we again begin, begin to see differences in our antibody alone and more significantly in the combination with the TLR7, where not only are we getting reduced set points, majority of the animals are now beginning to exhibit control um, even after rebound. And so the question becomes, um, did we achieve sterilizing cure in some of these cases or are they all functionally controlling but the virus is actually there. And so the most sensitive assay that we can do to date and something that we cannot do in humans is an adoptive transfer where we could take um, 30 million cells from infected animals and transfer them into naive recipients and ask can we transfer the infection. And so when we take our animals that transiently rebound but recontrol the virus and take their cells into naive recipients, we um, very quickly get um, peak viral loads in naive recipients. But on the contrary, the animals that did not rebound either from the combination or from the antibody alone treatment group um, remain aviremic. And so that's probably the most sensitive assay that we can have to measure viral reservoir. 
And so these data are obviously really exciting. We do have to keep in mind that this particular model um, is probably the lowest bar we can meet because we started therapy at day seven post-infection. So the initial reservoir is fairly small and the virus isn't particularly diverse, but nonetheless, I think this warrants further examination and we're interested in what it would do in the clinic. And so speaking of the clinic, our TLR7 agonist um, GS9620 has already completed um, phase 1A um, studies in healthy volunteers and is currently being um, administered to HIV patients on ART. We're going through slow um, dose walk-up from one milligram to eight milligram cohort. Um, at the earlier um, doses, we didn't see much pharmacodynamic markers, which we're interested in measuring, but at the six and now eight milligram dose, we're finally beginning to see some periphery cytokines. Um, and so we'd be interested to see what outcome that has um, in terms of um, virologic efficacy. We'll be looking to see if there's um, transient viral blips, which would suggest that we have some latency reversal. Um, and of course, we'll be doing uh, reservoir measurements to see if we've been able to reduce the reservoir um, in these patients. In parallel, we're doing an additional study, and this one is very similar, except the patients we're enrolling are these controllers, which means their pre-art viral loads were below 5,000 copies, which means their immune system is able to control the virus to some extent. And so in addition to all the other measurements, we're also gonna be able to do this analytic tre treatment interruption, essentially stop art therapy and see what happens to viral rebound kinetics, similar to what I've shown you in preclinical study. Um, as you can imagine, these patients are much more rare and so much more difficult to enroll. Um, we currently have 20 patients enrolled and six of them have already completed the treatment phase and are in um, treatment interruption. So once the study is unblinded, we'll be curious to see what the outcome is. And so in summary, this is where our TLR7 <coughs> program stands. I've shown you that our TLR7 is um, already in the clinic being tested in the HIV uh, positive patients. Our um, first effector um, antibody just entered the clinic, but because there is vast diversity of viral envelopes, we um, suspect that a single antibody will not be enough um, to cover the viral diversity, both within patients and across patients. And so we're currently um, lead optimizing a second antibody that would complement um, our original BNAP. And in terms of combination studies, um, we're currently working with Janssen to advance the combination of TLR7 agonist and vaccine into the clinic, um, and that should hopefully be happening soon. Um, I've shown you preclinical proof of concept data um, combining the antibody and TLR7, um, and we'll be excited to move that forward once the individual programs complete. Um, and of course, the interesting question would be next, can we get an even better response when we combine all three, the vaccine, antibody, and TLR7? Um, and we're just initiating these proof of concept studies in the animals. And so this is my acknowledgement slide. You can imagine that a lot of very talented scientists have contributed to this work. And I wanna acknowledge my colleagues, both from discovery and clinical research listed here. Um, our collaborator um, who um, carried out the vaccine and the antibody study, Dan Baruch. Uh, the military HIV research program that helped fund the vaccine study um, and Janssen for the vaccine and the contribution to the first preclinical study I described. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, so we're talking about the monkey study, right? So um, the animals that tended to control are ones that had lower viral reservoirs at the beginning, so there's definitely a correlation um, between um, the size of the reservoir and the response. So between the individuals with the similar level of so they have a similar response in this 
Correct. But yeah, I know that the reservoir in these animals was fairly small. Again, we're starting with a pretty small reservoir, and those are the only instances where we've been able to achieve cures. I think in much more chronically infected animals where the reservoirs are larger, it's going to be much more of a challenge. Okay. I have a question. Sure. So, kind of like... So I have a question about the drug is oral, and I think of TLR7 agonists as something you rub on the skin to irritate it and get rid of warts or something. So how is it, how is it you made that an oral drug without killing the GI tract? Um, it actually, a lot of it does end up in the GI tract, but it's actually beneficial because a lot of the reservoir for HIV resides in the gut. Mm -hmm. And so that's exactly where we want to hit the virus. So mm -hmm. it's actually a benefit to our... Um, so do to they have, have irritation of the, of the gut lining? And um, so this drug was found in phase one clinical studies to not have um, adverse side effects. I think the only side effects are um, generally those ones that you'll see with type one interferon production, like flu-like symptoms. Um, and again, and that's the reason why we're doing a very slow walk-up dose to make sure, so I'm sure at a certain level of TLR7 agonism, you will start seeing additional adverse um, effects, but we're careful at keeping the doses low. Good. Okay, thank you. Thank you.